Okay, so if you're wanting to just make something from scratch, I recommend um, starting up SketchUp and picking something with the architectural design in millimeters. So it'll always give you, it will always give you this blank canvas with this person um, who always looks at you no matter what angle you are oriented. Um, first thing I would always do is I would go into model info and change the display precision to at least three decimal places in my opinion. I like to go to four, but three is usually fine. Um, so, and yeah, again, make sure you're in decimal and millimeters, um, unless you're working with something that is very explicitly, like you're working with something that is designed in inches in Imperial, um, metric is just better. Just always do metric. Um, so, um, this just gives you a sense of scale. This is how big a person is roughly, obviously. And, um, I just always delete the person. Um, and then let's say, okay, we want to make a square. So you click the square tool, you can start at the origin point, and you only have to click once. You don't have to click and drag. You can just click and then this, and then you can click again to stop wherever you are. Um, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, you have down here the dimensions. Um, and if you want specific dimensions, once you've clicked the first time and you don't want to click the second time, uh, before you click the second time, let's say I want a 50 millimeter by a 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter. So 50 comma 50. Great. Now it's created a 50 by 50 millimeter square. 50 millimeters. 50 millimeters. Um, then you can use the push pull tool to go up another 50 again. You can type in exactly the distance that you want. So now we have a perfect cube. In my opinion, whenever you've created an aspect of an object, it is always good to make it a group. Um, but let's say, okay, we're in the group. If I wanted to do something like create a cross section, I can create this line. And once I've created this line, it's created two new surfaces. These new surfaces can now be pushed and pulled. So let's say, uh, yeah, I wanted to go midway down. So now I've created something like this. And let's say I actually wanted to create an arch. This is an interesting situation um, where what I can do is I'm outside of the group now. This is what I recommend, staying outside of the group, going from here to here and from here to here. Now go take the arch tool. And first of all, if you want, the arch will create by default an arch that is 12 sided. Um, SketchUp doesn't just have a way to make an infinitely curved arch, just it's not vector in that sort of way, let's say. Um, it is sort of raster, the same thing with when you're making a circle. It's actually, you're actually just making a polygon with a lot of sides. And if you look down at the bottom right here, you have 12. This is a 12 sided arch. Um, that's the default. And you can, before you click anywhere, you can decide, okay, I actually want a 20-sided arch. Now it'll make it 20-sided um, or lower. And so then you click on your two edges. Once you hit blue, that's what I typically prefer. It's tangent at vertex. So it's the most smooth it will possibly be, essentially. Um, so now we've created an arch here. And let's say, okay, I want to go here and I want to go here. Cool, I've created an interesting little arch. Um, again, make it a group in my opinion. Always make things groups. But let's say you don't really want these overhangs. 
you don't really, yeah, you don't really care for that. So now what you do is you create this. You kind of just use this line tool to create these. And now these are surfaces that you can push and pull. So you can go down with them, but you can also go up with them. So make it a group again. Now you can use the subtract tool to subtract it from, oh, okay, apparently, before you do that, you always wanna make sure something is considered a solid. So go into the solid inspector. It says external faces. Oh, interesting. Okay, that is because they're sharing one line here for something that is, it makes it much more complicated. So in that case, it's actually better to copy, paste this, and then flip, right click, flip around along the, not the red axis, sorry, the green axis, not the green axis either. Hmm? It's not the blue axis. And then, interesting. So I guess you don't want to do it that way. What you want to do is you want to, oh, because we're not, okay, I see. What I need to do is I need to move this here, grab this, move it to there, connect it there. Hello again. Um, and now you can move it here. And now you have two separate objects. And what you can do is you can do tools, solid tools, subtract, and you can subtract it from this. And then, again, the first one that you pick when you're doing subtract is the one you are subtracting from the other. So if I click this first, then two, I have subtracted. So now I've created this really interesting sort of arch that is still within the, within the square, let's say. And I can unify these two. So if I select them both and I go to union, now I've created one shape that has this very sort of interesting cutout. Um, let's see. Um, and if I wanted to do, you can also pick an individual line, let's say, and you can extend it. So if you wanna lock something in a direction, you can move in the blue direction. Seems to be the only direction I'm actually allowed to move in, in this case. Or I can actually move in the red direction if I click the right arrow, and then I can move in these directions if I, in, if I hit the left arrow, the green direction. And if I hit the blue arrow, that makes me go vertically up and down. So it locks me into a direction. If I hit escape, that locks, that unlocks me from any particular direction. But yes, so then I could, let's say, go down by 25 millimeters. So now we're halfway. So I'm not sure what the purpose of this would be, but again, just illustrating points that you can grab individual edges and then you can highlight them and then you can move them. And that'll move anything that's attached to it as well. But you can also get funky things like this. You don't, you don't ever want to see blue surfaces because blue surfaces means that it's internal. That's bad. Um, but if you don't even necessarily want to select an individual side, what you can do is you can just grab a corner. You don't need to select anything immediately. You just grab the corner that you're interested in and it'll move everything in relation to that corner. And if you're wanting to move something in relation to, or like along a particular path, what I highly recommend is in advance, before you decide to move something, is 
creating a line. Let's say, yeah, we're going to go out another 50 and then another 50 here, right? And then I'm going to connect it, but not for the sake of doing anything with it other than to just be a guide. You can use guides, but and guides uh, are useful in a certain capacity, but I a lot of times I actually just prefer creating lines that I then delete because you can follow lines in a way that guides don't seem to work quite as well, in my opinion. So, um, so yeah, let's say I wanted to grab this corner. I can follow this line now, and then it's created something like that. And then I can just grab this line and delete it because it wasn't inside of the group, so it didn't attach itself. So now I've created kind of a, I guess I've kind of created a snail. <laughs> That's kind of funny, like a rhino snail. Um, let's see. Um, what other aspects are worth discussing? Um, I Making would say, holes. oh, what? Making holes. Making holes. Okay. Um, one second. I'm turning up your volume. Um, so yeah, let's say we wanted to give this little snail eyes. Um, so making holes, like you said. Um, I would change the shape from a rectangle to a circle. And again, the sides are already predetermined. In this case, the number of sides are 24. So it's doubled the arch. Um, so if you're on, yeah, if you, you want to use a, a point of contact, let's say, it will automatically snap to a certain orientation. If you want to, again, pick the orientation that is slightly different, you can go vertical for this direction, or like the up arrow for this direction, the right arrow for the red direction, and the left arrow for this direction, and the down arrow for tangent to whatever the, whatever the surface is that you're on. So let's say I actually just want to do the down arrow. So, and let's say we want to make a hole of five millimeters, right? Okay. And we want to create five millimeter tall hole. Again, make, make things groups. It's really quite helpful. Now, I want to Oops. I want to rotate it in a way that will be useful. So I'm going to do this. And then rotate it 45 degrees. And I'm going to copy this, paste it in place so we have two of them. So now we have two. going to bring it up to this level. Now I'm going to take one of them and move it in Oops. Incorrect. Hmm. Okay, so again, this is where it's useful to create something. Um, create something that goes in this direction and then continues on that tangent, let's say. And if you hold shift, it'll lock it into that tangent direction. Let's say 
10 millimeters. And again, I want to go here, and then I want to go 10 millimeters out. Nope, that's the wrong tangent. So grab one of them, follow to the edge, grab the other one, whoops, follow to the edge, and then we can move them both back at the same time. By, oops. You do want to, again, if you can, you can, there's a correct way to lock them in because we're working, I'm in I guess I'm working on a particularly strange angle. This is a normal, again, Normally, it is better so that you don't have to make all of these guides and you can go along either the green, red, or blue direction, the vertical axis or the X, Y, and the X, Y axes. Um, but we're actually working at an interesting angle. See, everything is actually working completely diagonally. So um, sometimes you have to work that way. I mean, but other times you can try to orient things correctly. Um, that's my preferred method, but this is a good good way of illustrating certain points. Um, again, we can try to go there, and that goes all the way to 15. Oftentimes making these guides is good because and now we have Again, they can follow along these guides. Then you can delete these. Uh, looks like we're gonna need to push this out a little bit further. So yeah, just, why not, 15. Pull it out by 15, same thing with this. Pull it out by 15. And what you can do is you can now take this Again, tools, solid tools, subtract, and subtract it from here. And take this, subtract it from here. And now you've kind of given some eyes to your little rhino snail in this case. And notice, you've actually created something that is, has some depth. The amount of space here is different than the amount of space over there which actually connects directly. So that's a good thing to know. Um, now, if you want to have interlocking parts, um, what I recommend is creating, let's say, okay, a five millimeter hole. Um, actually, in this case, Something much simpler, if you do just want to do this, you can just create a surface directly on a group, um, five millimeters, and then you can push it in. You can just use the push-pull tool. You can do that as well, but it won't, work on, it won't work on curved surfaces, which is why you have to use, for curved or angled surfaces, you are going to have to use the subtract tool rather than just the push-pull tool after you create a surface. So um, let's say we want to go five up as well. We can work in units of five. That's always nice and easy. Um, so now what you're gonna want to do is when you're making your circle, you can create the circle here, and then what you can do is you can subtract it using the um, this tool, which is the offset tool. So you've already created a surface. Now offset it by 0.25. That is good for interlocking parts when you're 3D printing. Now you can grab this outer edge and delete it. 
and then push this up by another five so that it directly touches the roof, which is fine. Um, and now you've created a part that could interlock with it, but obviously you don't just want a stud that can go in there. You want that to be attached to something else. So we can make a polygon, or polygon rather, sorry. Um, that then has some depth here. Make it a group. Now, what you can do in these sort of circumstances, technically it's not attached to that other part that we had just created. So what you want to do to attach them is you're gonna have to unionize them. But, um, but it's inside of the snail, so how do you get to it? So what you can do is you can either very simply, you can, for instance, move this piece vertically down by 10 millimeters, and then same thing, move this piece down vertically by 10 millimeters, and now they're directly on top of one another now that it's been exposed, and then you can unionize them, you can unionize them there. If you didn't want to do that and move everything out of the way and then move it back, what you can do instead is you can just hide this piece. Right click, hide, and then you can grab these two, tools, solid, union. Great, now it's one. And then you can go edit, unhide, last or all, depending on if you have multiple things hidden um, and you want to see them, see them all, then obviously you do all. And if you just want to unhide the very last thing you hit, you just do last. Um, and then there we go. Now we have this little hexagon that can snap into our little sl slug friend. Um, and if we wanted to make it so that even though this doesn't have any relevance because it's a circle um, in there, let's say we wanted this to align with this. You just click the edge and then boom. Now, this little stud can lock in to this slug, or snail, rather, and is in the correct orientation for this. Um, yeah, um, what other things are important to illustrate? Um, what other design principles? Oh, if you want to be able to see something, let's say you want to be able to see the sud inside, um, it might be useful to make this piece semi-transparent. What you should do in that case, you should go to materials and you can go in here and translucent glass gray. In my opinion, that's the one that I like to use, but there are several others. And then you can click the paint bucket and then there it is. And so now you can see that there's a little hole that this is locking into. And that's a little useful skill. Um, but additionally, you don't have to keep on um, always going into the materials and paint bucket. Now that you've done it once, it's one of your regular materials. So you can just click here and switch it back and forth. Why I stand corrected? That's very strange. Why isn't correct regular white one of them? Like, huh. Like I can turn that, that, but this, oh, okay. I just didn't know that it was scrolled all the way to the bottom. There we go. So we could do the inverse if we wanted to as well. If we wanted to see, oh, hey, there's a hole here, but you really want to keep your slug, your snail, um, mostly visible. You can go the opposite direction. Um, yeah. Um, sometimes when you're dealing with complex and curved surfaces and you want to unionize things or subtract things, um, when you're dealing with things with a lot of edges, um, when you're working with something this small, for some reason SketchUp doesn't like it, even though I'm not entirely sure why, because hypothetically it should be the same at any scale. Um, 
what SketchUp is doing, but for some reason it's not. So if you wanted to do something kind of complicated, like a very, let's say, okay, we're gonna do a six, a 500, and you can click, also yeah, when it comes to arches and circles, you can click on them before you've extruded or before you've pushed or pulled them. This only works before you've pushed or pulled them. When they're still flat, you can click here for the number of segments and change it. So let's say I want it to be a 500 segmented square. Now see, it's very smooth. It's hard to tell. Very, very smooth now. Um, and now I'm gonna push it. Um, Actually, first what we're gonna do is we're gonna select it and we're gonna scale it back down to 10% of the size. Ooh. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's percent, so you don't just do 10. You would want to do 0.1. My apologies. And then we're gonna extrude this by five. Let's go another 10, 15 millimeters total. Again, always make something a group. If I wanted to do something kind of complicated, like rotate this upward, And I wanted to, for some reason, wanted to slice it like this. Um, my guess, I'm gonna wanna subtract this from our little snail. My guess is that SketchUp is gonna do something funky. Oh, wow, it did it perfectly. Of course it did. Um, that is not normally what happens. So, in the circumstances where you have a lot of, like you have smooth, you have like a curved surface here and then a curved surface here and they're interlocking and these sort of things. Uh, and you have like a little corner that's gonna get cut off, all of these sort of things. What I recommend is actually upscaling. So you click your two objects that you're interested in working with. Um, and um, you might as well even grab this object even though you're not having any interaction with it, just so everything stays in its correct place relative to each other, then you can grab a corner and it'll uniformly scale. And at the bottom right here, you can see the scale. So I'm going to type in 100. So we're going huge in comparison. And then you can take this and subtract it from this. And then you can take your parts again that you're interested in and scale them back down 0 0.01 so that's would bring it back to its original size and oftentimes it will actually move positions because now relative when you scaled it back down it's in a different relative position where it was in comparison to where it was with that other object that you subtracted because it changed the slight dimension so that's annoying that's why I say Oftentimes, you might want to even scale parts that you're not trying to interact with, if so long as they're interlocking so that they stay in the same relative position to one another. Um, so yeah, so now you have, clearly some predator took a bite out of our uh, triceratops uh, snail or slug or whatever this is. Um, so that's quite sad. Um, Hmm, what other concepts are useful for you to know? Yes, always make sure that you do, when you're doing solid work stuff, do um, use your solid inspector. Additionally, when you're inside here, let's say, oh, okay, I'm going, I have, for some reason, I have all these extra lines that are connecting 
these parts together, but they don't do anything. It's not like I've actually extruded any of, I've not actually pushed or pulled any of these surfaces. They don't, these lines don't contribute anything. And I have a lot of them. Let's say I have a lot, a lot of them, and I don't want to have to deal with manually going in and clicking and deleting all of these things. Um, and sometimes those can result from unifying and all of those sort of things. You can have extra things that are not, were not intended to be there. What you can do is you can go into extensions, clean up, clean. Pretty much you can check almost every option. Uh, I do end up not clicking ignore normals and ignore materials most of the time, but otherwise I pretty much click everything and then you can hit clean up. And then it'll also, it'll do it and then gives you the results. And ta-da, guess what? It got rid of all of those extra parts uh, or all those extra lines. Um, yeah. Um, what is there are there more concepts that you would like to learn i think um the concept of printability and the fact that um sometimes you need to flip the part um and and think that the way how it's going to be built is layer by layer mm -hmm. um so something that's um a very uh, steep overhang may not want to print well and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yes. So, um, yeah, thankfully, in this case, our Rhino would quint, print probably pretty well. Um, it may have some difficulties printing these eye holes, but my guess is probably not. But it would have difficulty, my guess, is printing this because Again, as you just said, it prints layer by layer. So it's going to go up and up and up and up and up and everything's probably gonna be fine up until we probably hit, yeah, as you can see, this is quite a steep angle. Um, my guess is that probably is gonna be fine up until about here. And then once you start having to print like this, it's probably going to fail. Um, so you have to take, you do have to keep that in mind when you're designing objects, sometimes it's completely unavoidable and you just need to create an object that does have a big arch or quite li literally a shelf sometimes. And that's just what it needs to be depending on how it's interacting with other objects. Um, and then in that case, you're gonna have to print supports. But if you can avoid supports, I highly recommend avoiding supports. Um, highly, highly recommend avoiding supports by creating arches kind of like this, but ideally lessening the arches. Um, so in this case, what you could do again, um, well, you don't really, this doesn't, isn't really illustrative of anything real, but um, we could just honestly get rid of this whole section um, by doing something like this, creating, an object that we then, again, subtract but this is not even a solid. So again, what is the matter? There's a surface border. What's going on? Ah. Here we go, we have a giant open face. So always make sure that you have connections. There we go. And 
ta-da, now this object shouldn't have any, um, shouldn't have any problem printing. But what you can also think of is alternative ways to printing it, even if it's not the way that it's going to be, or the object is going to be oriented in real life when you're using it or it's interacting with another part, you can try to design the part in such a way that it will be able to be printed um, by, um, it will be able to be printed, uh, let's say on its side or something. Um, if we wanted to do, let's say like an arch, obviously an arch, um, yeah, um, hold on one second, Z, I'm so sorry. We can cut this out. Oh, yeah, let me know. Yes. Okay, so yeah, let's say we're making an arch. Um, actually, better to make an arch in this way, in my opinion. Create an arch like this. If we're just creating just a straight arch, do something like this instead. Um, and five, let's say five millimeters. Or actually, why am I doing that yet? Five millimeters. Then you just use your line, connect from point to point. and you can delete these, and you can delete the internal. Great, great, you've had an arch. And this is what you need in reality, that you need an arch like this. Um, but obviously you can't print an arch like this. This is going to, this is not going to result in something <laughs> that's going to end well. So what you would want to do is actually, because there's not no problem with it, you would want to print it on one of its flat sides. You'd want to print it like this. But okay, let's say it's something more complicated than that. Yeah, then the, no problem if it's just something like this. If it's something though that has, um, let's say, a something that comes out of it like this then obviously now what you're going to have to do is you can't print it on this side anymore but you could have to print it on this side but <laughs> let's say that it had something that went out both sides now you have a much more complicated problem because um, you can't print it like this and you also can't print it on one of its sides in that case what you honestly might have to do is you might actually have to print it like this. You might have to print it upside down, which then you might still need supports. Um, you might still need supports for this, um, or you might need to create what's known as a, uh, rather than a skirt, um, you might need to create a raft, which directly attaches to a singular point, which is maybe not the most uh, doesn't have the most contact or surface area, but it can easily break off from the piece, but it allows it to stay more stable. Um, but usually you want to avoid a situation, that's the whole thing. When you're designing objects, you have to think in advance. Again, like you were saying, how can this be printed to not just um, how does this work functionally, but how does this work on the printer? And the, while uh, supports are a possibility, highly recommend avoiding supports if you can. And so designing objects that are at, um, that rather than having shelves, have arches uh, and not too steep of arches or have other method or potentially even just a straight line, um, but at a curved angle as opposed to, or like a curve, I'm um, sorry, uh, oh, a sort of, what am I trying to say? Rather than a vertical or horizontal, a um, angled line um, that can also get you there. Um, I highly recommend <laughs> avoiding a part like this. A part like this is a nightmare to try to figure out how to print. Um, 
But you can so, make it into two pieces, right? That's another, that is another possibility. You could try to print this in two pieces. You could split this straight down the middle and then you could print it on one side and then the other and then glue them together and potentially have some sort of studs in between that, inter, that interlock them that then you could easily use to glue together. Um, you could do that too. Or you could, um, rather than splitting it down this middle, you could split it down even the center middle um, and then um, print it on, let's say, actually like this side. You could print it. Oh gosh, how do I orient the camera correctly? Great. Let's say, oh gosh, come on. <laughs> Playing with the camera is fun. Um, yeah, let's say you cut it down the middle here and you printed it on this surface. Now the arch here is actually relatively easy. The printer could do that and you have a relatively flat surface to start with that has a good base. So yeah, you do have to get creative about splitting parts up um, that could be printed individually and then potentially glued together or interlocked through studs, like again, like kind of like what we did with the, our little slug, um, or just designing parts all together that avoid any sort of problems with arches. Um, also, you do want to avoid incredibly small details. Incredibly small details are not likely to print on printers. Thankfully, for the purposes of what we're doing, um, very rarely do we need incredibly small details for objects. Um, it, it's just usually not a, a necessity. There are some notable exceptions, um, but usually a printer, or our printer currently can only go to 0.1 millimeter of um, 0.1 millimeter or 100 nanometers, uh, or sorry, 100 micro micrometers of uh, distance for layer heights. But the new print head that we're about to get is able to go to 0.05 millimeters um, or 50 micrometers of detail this, as the smallest layer height. And that's on the Z axis. But on the X and Y axes, that also is limited by um, the amount of detail that's the detail that's limited by there is actually mostly the the size of the nozzle. Our nozzle, I believe, is 0.5 millimeters um, large. Um, so 0.5 millimeters um, is the smallest amount of details you're really going to be able to get in an X, Y direction, just because that's how thick the filament is. Um, now, you can get nozzles that have smaller holes, um, and that will allow you to have more XY detail. But then that's a trade-off for um, speed. The larger the print hole, the quicker you're gonna, going to be able to print, uh, because more filament is able to be extruded more quickly. Uh, so you do have trade-offs. Uh, Yeah, uh, let's see what other design concepts are worthwhile noting. Um, filament reduction is always a great idea too. If you can make something that's strong and sturdy but uses less filament, um, that's always a great idea. Uh, it will reduce the amount of print time and the amount of filament, which will also reduce the cost, especially if you're doing it for a client. Um, they like to see less print cost in that capacity. Um, but mostly just time, honestly. That's the biggest thing, in my opinion, is time. 36-hour um, prints always make me, like, you know, anything more, a print that's anything more than 10 hours always kind of makes me nervous just because I'm not going to sit there for 10 hours. And if it screws up, that's a whole, then you've, wasted all that time and now you have to do another 10 hour print and that's a whole big ordeal. So breaking things up into multiple parts is great for that again, because then if you do break things up, you're only potentially screwing up one part when you're printing it. Um, or when, um, 
or um, additionally, like you're also um, maybe using less filament um, and using less filament means less time. So yeah, I mean, sometimes it's inevitable. Like our Frequenza box, um, that if it's printed at the proper dimensions, that's going to take like like 17 hours or something like that, I think, to print uh, a five by three box. And that's just is what it is. It's not great because again, you've wasted a lot of time and a lot of filament if um, something goes wrong, but uh, it is an inevitability. So don't be don't be entirely afraid of doing something just because it's going to use a lot of film. It, use your best judgment as to, okay, this is a necessity to be like this bulky, or it's maybe that's just ex it's excessive for my given task. Um, and make sure you set up a printer in a perfect condition. So for example, don't, um, um, don't try to print sub something super large without first checking that the filament is easily pulled out of the box um, or that the filament is fresh and dry um, because that's giving you a higher chance of failure and you just multiply that chance by the number of hours that you're going to print. Um, also printing more than one part in, in, a, in a go is, uh, is more risky. Um, in theory you can put you know print on your whole print bed in practice, it's um, probably more prudent to do one piece at, the, at a time. Right, and that's also, it's important to note that, I mean, this depends on your printer, but um, when you're leveling, if it's auto level or if it's manual level, you're typically leveling based on the center of your printer. And so usually the very center of your printer is the most leveled. And as you get towards the corners, um, you get slightly less level. So if you're using the entirety of your print bread, um, then there's possibilities of things going wrong towards the edges because they're not quite potentially as level as the center. So again, you have to use your best judgment about that. Um, always monitor the first layer. Do not leave the printer until the first layer is done printing. Um, to make sure that it has good adhesion, it's not bubbling up, it's not creating any sort of problems, um, because if it screws up on the first layer, you're, there's no recovery, basically. Um, never leave the printer alone at the first layer. Um, yes. Hmm. All right. The tolerance between interlocking parts. 0.25 on each part, right? Yes, highly, rec yeah, it's a great tolerance, at least for our printer, again, we're using NGen, we're using uh, Lulzbot TAS 6, and we're using, with the standard print head right now, uh, tool head, which has a nozzle diameter of 0.5 millimeters, which um, that will increase or decrease the tolerances um, for holes in interlocking parts. Um, so that will change from printer to printer. I mean, or sorry, really more from nozzle to nozzle uh, diameter. That's really the thing that matters the most. Um, but for a 0.5 millimeter nozzle, 0.25 extension from an interlocking part usually works great, usually works very well, um, in my opinion just like what we did down here. Mm -hmm. That is a 0.25 millimeter difference from here to here, but obviously total, the diameter difference is 0.5 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay.